So we'll go ahead and call our meeting to order and uh, entertain a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Make right. sure the cameras are up. Okay, we'll go ahead and go back. Uh, motion to go back into a special meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we came out, of, we were in closed session and there is no reportable action at this time. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn the special meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Okay. We'll now call this meeting of the Jackson City Council to order. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's uh, watching the uh, meeting on G10 television. And uh, we're going to begin tonight. And uh, I want to make note that we are observing uh, social distancing here tonight. We have also uh, are abiding by the suggested number of people that, that should be, you know, in the same room. Um, that's why we have an empty council chambers. Uh, so we're going to have start off with the Pledge of Allegiance led by council member Dr. Angela Washington, followed by the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again this evening to give you thanks. To give you thanks for this day and for all the blessings you so graciously bestow upon us individually and as the city of Jacksonville. <clears throat> we especially give thanks this evening that you have spared our city and our community from the large cases of coronavirus that so many other areas in our state and our nation has, they have, have been inflicted upon them. We pray as that as our society and our economy begins to open that our citizens will continue the good practices so that we can keep this virus down in our city and our county. We pray for all those who have been so adversely affected by this horrendous disease, for those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, those who have lost jobs, whose businesses have been closed for several weeks. We pray that during this period of time that you would be with them and that you, they would know your presence and that they would know that there is going to be a brighter tomorrow and that you're going to be in it. We pray for our service members who are serving us here and around the world this evening for their safety and for their families. And as always, we pray for our mayor and for our council that your guidance and direction would be with them. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> received a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting. I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda, uh, but also uh, would like to uh, include in that motion, removing item number 21 under non-consent discussion items uh, until a later time. I'll make a motion to approve with the uh, amendment, removing item number 21 for future discussion. Second. We have a motion to second, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. That brings us to our first section of public comment for the evening. <clears throat> and uh, I want to read this real quick. It's now that we do have some folks that signed up for public comment. So I'm going to read this from the Council of uh, Rules here. It's now time for public comment portion of the agenda. This is a time that the council has set aside during each regular meeting to hear comments from the public. 
This is not a question and answer session, but of time for you to express your views on city issues uh, to the council. Each speaker who signed the public comment sign up sheet may come to the podium and I call your name. Please state your name and address for the record. You may speak for up to three minutes. When the timer at the podium and also displayed on the screen turns yellow, that is a signal that there is 30 seconds of time remaining. You may wish to begin wrapping up your comments at that time. So I'm going now, <clears throat> we do have two, two people that have signed up for public comment. And I think the first one's going to miss, be Mr. Ken Hagan. Mr. Hagan. Mayor and Council, I appear before you tonight uh, to talk about Jack and Ed. Um, on April the 14th, 1969, I walked through the doors of Jack and Ed as a city employee for the first time. For the next 30 years, it was my home away from home. It taught me a lot. It taught me about this community. It taught me about what a recreation building can mean to a community, especially a, a community that needed a building to be able to go to and feel safe and be able to hang out. As I look around this room, I actually see at least one person who went through that door with me many times, Councilman Jackson. I see another council person, Washington, whose brother came many times. Did you ever come? A few times. Mm -hmm. I know of two individuals who actually met their spouses in that building. What I want to say to the council tonight is that whatever decision you make, and I'm not here to comment on any of the difficult decisions that you have to make, that's, that's, your, that's your deal. But I wanted to impress upon you what a building like that means. It means everything to the people that will use it. Jack Amiette has been used for 60 years. The building that you approve whenever you approve it will probably last 100 years. Think of all of the people that it's going to affect. I want to say to you tonight to think about what this building will do, how it will be used. If it's used the way Jack Amiette was used over the last 60 years, it'll be a blessing to those that do use it. It's a sanctuary for young people. It's a meeting place for older people. I can remember one of the happiest times we had in there. The staff decided one, one morning we would have a breakfast uh, for the participants of the programs. And we advertised it, and it was on a Saturday morning, and we had the breakfast, and we were anticipating about 20 or 30 people, and we served um, pancakes, which is all we knew how to fix, actually. We had over 100 kids that showed up. And it told us something right there that this was a sanctuary. This was a place where they came because they didn't have any other place to go. So as you deliberate, as you make this very difficult decision, I want you to think of how long this building will be used, how it's going to be used, and how the last building was used. I know you have a difficult decision to make. I thank you for your time. I just felt very strongly I had to come in front of you and just tell you what the history of this building was. I did it in three minutes. It would take me 30 minutes or longer to, to really do it. But again, I know you have a difficult decision. And I hope that, uh, you know, this is something that we're all going to be proud of in the future. So, Mayor and Council, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Hagan. Thank you for the information. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have Mike Carter, uh, 304 Brookview. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to come speak before you this evening. I'm here to speak about Jack Amiet. <clears throat> uh, there's a few of you in this room that had the privilege of growing up and going through Jack Amiet, and I was one of those ones that not only had the opportunity to grow up and play at Jack Amiet, I also had the opportunity to work there for 20 some years before we moved to the commons. Jack Amiette himself, the people that were lucky enough to know Mr. Amiette was Mr. Recreation. The people 
respected him and honored him, and they built three facilities back in 1960. You have an opportunity now to build another facility, and you got to realize that what you build is going to last 60 years or more. I advise and, and we hope and pray that you find the money to do it and do it the right way and not cut corners. I'd rather you not build something than cut corners because cutting corners will not do the job. Jack Amiet is was home to many kids. That was their home. They'd rather come there after school and they stayed till, the, till they had to go home. That was where their friends were. They were safe. They had opportunity to play, opportunity to learn. I ran into a gentleman yesterday. I was out riding my bicycle and stopped me on the street and he says, I know you. You used to work at Jack Amiet. And I said, yes, sir, I did. And I said, I apologize. I don't recognize your face. And he says, I was one of the pickets. And I knew quite a few of the pickets. And he said how well he remembers the days of going to Jack Amiet and playing. There's many, many families over the years that complimented not only us, but other people about how proud they were that they knew their kids could go there and knew they were safe. Nothing would happen to them. Kids of all ages and adults went to that facility and played. Not only used the front building for ping pong, the caroms, and all kind of board games, but they used a gym. And I'll tell you about the shortcomings. When the gym was built, it was added onto the back of the building. It was not a full regulation size court. It had a tile floor. During basketball season, when it was winter time, you'd have those days when it would get 75 degrees. And we all know how that is here in Jacksonville. And when it got humid, that floor would sweat. And we'd have to crank those air conditioners on full blast to keep those floors dry so we could play games. So like I said, if you're going to do something, please do it the right way. And I know it's tough times with this virus going on. I know the budgets are tight. And, and I hope that you'll do your best to look at all the options. But remember, none of us know what the future is going to hold 60 years from now. Things do change. But the New River neighborhood is important to this city. And Miss Washington, you know, and Brian, you know, and Randy, you probably know too. Kids used to talk about, they didn't come from Jacksonville. They came from Pickettown. They came from May Patch. They came from Northwoods Park. They came from old Jacksonville. And all of it's part of Jacksonville. But they had their heritage. And New River was part of that. Mm -hmm. I can remember kids going to Kerr Street playing ball down there going to the center and they said, it's time we went over to Jack Amy and got to play on the court. And they would walk or ride their bikes across town. Mm -hmm. I wish those kids could be here today and speak what it meant to them. But I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. I know you got a tough decision and I respect your decision, whatever decision you make. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, we don't have anybody else here, do we? All right. So I do have something to add here for public comment. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Richard Woodruff if you would join me up front with your beautiful wife, Gwen. Thank you for coming tonight. Hey, don't mention that the mayor has curly hair. <laughs> you, you're still cutting hair with that? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. I, I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, that I want people to know. Sorry, I don't have a room full of people here tonight, but we do have the we do have G10 television. So, 
Uh, on May 25th, 2010, Dr. Richard Woodruff officially began work for the city of Jacksonville as the city manager. Um, but he kind of started a little bit before that because uh, I think you came to a budget meeting and saw how the budget was being unfolded and everything and you looked and uh, thought there may be a better way so you kind of helped us re redesign the budget at that time uh, as far as the budget documents concerned. This was kind of a omen of things to come with Dr. Woodruff at the helm of city manager. Richard uh, saw an opportunity to improve the appearance of our city by creating the Clean and Green Jacksonville program. He enlisted me to, to help uh, remove some of the overgrown weeds at the uh, curb across from what's now the uh, Center for Public Safety. The Clean and Green Jacksonville program continues today with outstanding landscaping and other actions to beautify and improve our city. He spent Saturday mornings sweeping up and cleaning many of the places here in town. He still does. And he's been dedicated to his personal, this personal community service. A lot of people don't know that, but he does use a lot of his own time to go out there and do those things. Actually, one of our citizens did comment and was surprised to see the city manager on a Saturday morning sweeping the trail across from Hargett Street. He saw slum and blight and took action to increase dem demolitions of derelict and abandoned structures. The number is now well over 120 structures that have been torn down to beautify our city. Richard led a team that got approvals for a $30 million bond that built the Center for Public Safety, Fire Station 2, and the Sturgeon City Environmental Center, Education Center. Richard stopped a disjointed process of design for the Center of Public Safety, no telling how that would have turned out had you not interceded in that, and got the council consensus before he led the design with, his, with a personal touch. When problems were presented for the current city hall building, uh, leaking windows and walls and all that sort of stuff, he led the effort to fix them. Drawing on the elements of this building, he personally sketched out others that included a bathroom standard, fire station number two, and the soon to be built Jacksonville station. Richard has accepted the challenge for what is now Jacksonville Landing. This amazing and well used project took the collaboration of the county, wildlife commission and the city. His vision for this site was captured in a drawing that became the master plan. He has personally guided recreation and parks facility upgrades. He designed challenge courses with the most recent one completed by a Boy Scout. He created a partnership with cyclists that grew both downtown redevelopment and recreational opportunities. Richard sought to inspire downtown redevelopment with a design for streetscapes. He rallied property and business owners to do this. He also got involved, uh, worked out a deal with Jonathan Popkin with Boomtown Furniture and, and got uh, helped the Zimzum Children's Museum realize a dream that they had of a building, of the old Boomtown building. He inspired splash pads, something we didn't even think about. You know, there are, for many years we had these little pools around town, and, but the splash pads are such a hit with the kids. Uh, you go out there on a summer day now, it, it, any of the splash pads here, and you're going you're gonna to see a crowd of youngins out there having a good time with their parents. He got the Unified Development Ordinance finished. He assembled an impressive group of developers, business operators, and interested citizens to guide the process. But it was his vision that was eventually adopted by the council. His leadership in water and sewer matters has created a master list of projects that will ensure safe drinking water and safe disposal of wastewater for decades. Dr. Woodruff supported and strongly encouraged partnership agreements with the military. When others were questioning the value of such agreements, he saw the power of them in securing the partnerships that creates the economic engine and the source of pride for our community. He took a random phone call after the post, uh, post office gave up the passport service and turned it into a profitable venture for the city. None of us had any idea at first 
that this would be a $200,000 a year uh, windfall for the city. And it's a convenience for our citizens. It created a, a very good, uh, the process, I've had so many people that have complimented the process of how easy it is uh, here compared to what it had been. Riverwalk Marina was created by you. He championed the opportunity for the purchase of the land. And by doing so, he has ensured quality waterfront access for the public that will be enjoyed for generations. To protect uh, the treasured and well-used Riverwalk Crossing Park, he set limits on the number of major public events there. He encouraged Winterfest to show off the park at night. National Night Out to welcome all to our city and he created a better space for the North Carolina Symphony to perform. He lives by TNT. What's that? Today, not tomorrow. Exactly. And the three E's? Efficiency, economy, effectiveness. In his service to our community. Proud of that. His leadership is absolute with a firm hand by guiding this city through many emergency events. He has changed how employees are hired. He personally welcomes most, of their, most on their first day of work and work to ensure the process to consider, employee, or consider employees in a fair manner. Dr. Woodruff demands great public, uh, customer service. Many a concern has been personally reconciled by his actions. He has used that spirit of sweeping the streets to do some manual labor that has resolved an issue by a citizen. The core program was championed by him to instill that good customer service, the Apple Award, has been, uh, and the Apple Awards have been advanced by him to reward good customer service and recognize the best examples. He knows most of the city uh, employees by their first name. You do. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can recite most of their children's names and their spouses. And he remembers the names of some of their pets. Especially their dogs. Especially their dogs. And he has encouraged many to stop smoking with incentives and personal challenges. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff, for helping me to quit smoking. It's been my honor. <laughs> he, he, he told me he would have my truck uh, detailed. detailed if I quit. Oh, there you go. And I can't, I, can't, I can't put away a challenge like that. But I, thank you for helping me quit. You, you were looking out for my health and well-being. He chose to live in downtown Jacksonville as part of the pioneers who have seen the changes in the area. He encouraged and developed a standard for affordable housing. From deciding to look uh, to the look, uh, his vision is now seen in the housing downtown. And they've done a great job down there. His span of knowledge is great from water and sewer issues to construction issues to financing, planning, development, and on all aspects of city government. He's quick to pick up his pen and draw a diagram of what he wants done from parking lots to building design to landscaping. All have been initially designed by him. He volunteers his time, as I said before, does volunteer work that others do not see, and he has contributed a significant portion of his earnings to advance city nonprofits. On June 2nd, 2015, we recognized him for five years of service, commenting on his strong faith and leadership. Today, we also commend him for the accomplishments made by him for our city. Therefore, it is with the great pleasure that we now present you with your 10-year longevity certificate and a more valuable pen for your uh, lapel. And we say thank you with a very short video we'd like to see of some of the things that we have attributed to you.
and I would like to personally say, Dr. Woodrow, if you have made Jacksonville a better place with your, with your presence and your work here in this community, and it is so much appreciated. I mean, you're, you're a good, you've done a, done a great job for us, and I hope you continue to. I know we have to replace the social distance, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick comment. Uh, nothing is done by one person. The mayor and council have made it possible. You, the taxpayers, have funded these things, and only together do we move forward. Also, I remind everyone, there are 563 employees who come to work every day for the same mission, and that is to improve the quality of life here in Jacksonville. It's been my privilege to work here 10 years. It's hard to believe life goes by as fast as it does, but thank you very much. Yeah, there's a contract for the next package for another 10. But thank you so much. Man, thank you so much for coming with us tonight. And uh, uh, again, like I say, we still got a lot to accomplish here. Mm -hmm. Make sure you stay for just a few minutes. The party continues. <laughs> we have a party. <laughs> we do. I've never seen his hair that long. Uh-oh, what do we got going on? Uh, I had to put a ponytail up here. Mm -hmm. Yours is getting long, too. Oh, my goodness, you got my sister out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Please join us. Hey. Well, today is certainly a, uh, a special day uh, for all of us. We're, we're honoring two great individuals, and... Um, it's truly an honor uh, to have been asked to do this tonight and um, for many reasons, um, but this is an honor for me to do and I appreciate it. On March 18, 1974, a young Sammy Phillips took the oath of office as, Jacksonville, as a Jacksonville police officer. It is hard to imagine that he could have seen the dramatic changes that would take place in the 30 years that he served as a police officer and the 15 years he served as an elected official of Jacksonville. He worked in all areas of police department from patrol officer, detective, and eventually becoming the second in command as deputy chief of police. There were but 45 police officers and four patrol cars when he began. Interesting number. The Jacksonville city li limits were much smaller than they are now, but guarded closely by those officers. He sat at the police dispatch station, manned a crime scene, and investigated troubling crimes. He's seen the best and the worst of our community. He was the one who served as manager of the department's accreditation efforts. That was a task he performed for more than a decade. The department won national accreditation in 1991 with great credit given to him for his leadership in this effort. His attention to detail that led to the accreditation had been shown in his work to win a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. While working, he took night classes through North Carolina Wesleyan College to achieve the degree in 1984. He had built on the associate's degree he had won at Coastal Carolina Community College. Later, he drove to Greenville two nights a week to win his master's in public administration from East Carolina University. This was conferred in December of 2000. In 1998, he successfully completed the Federal Bureau of Investigations National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. It was a goal of his to attend and to graduate from this prestigious institution of law enforcement. During his police tenure, he has seen murders, murder suicides, mysterious deaths, and the heyday of Court Street. He worked with names that share a, his, a historical significance in Jacksonville. He brought National Night Out to Jacksonville. 
He served as the first chair of the committee and organized this event at, that has become an institution for the city. Now he opens the event every year as the mayor. While this year's event has been postponed, the program has benefited our community and relations between the Jacksonville police and our citizens. It has involved other law enforcement organizations across our country and has received numerous awards for the organization and its mission. He has seen many transformations of uniforms for police, radio systems that use tubes to modern and efficient systems, many different police cars, many different haircuts, except for today, and facial hair over time. He has seen and led the evolution of a professional police force that's in place today. With having achieved accreditation for the police department and serving some legendary chiefs such as Roger Halbert and Clyde Cook, and for a short time, Michael Yanero, he elected to retire. He left the employment of the city in 2004, playing golf and enjoying life. Just a few months later, he filed for an at-large seat on the city council. He won in November, serving with then mayor, Jan Bean Slagle, whom he had known for her works in the news. When she announced that she would not run again, he made his decision to run for mayor. He was elected in November of 2007 in every election since that time. He was very proud to have his parents participate in his oath taking. I remember that very well. His tenure has seen the hiring of Dr. Richard Woodruff, the transition of the council to four year terms to add stability to city programs, and a redistricting effort significantly compressed after the 2010 census. A significant activity has been one of helping with community relations. The mayor's faith committee was first created to improve communications, but has become an inspiration for how our community is a caring community. It was during the summer of 2015 and there was a racial discord after the Charleston shooting. The leadership of the mayor was appreciated to help strengthen the bonds of our community. The committee advanced a one city movement, embracing it with public appearances at National Night Out and creating an environment to celebrate the spirit of civility in our community. Today, the one city moment advances community relations. It created an esprit de corps that permeates within the city staff. The mantra has been repeated by employees as they help our citizens work together on community projects and providing excellent customer service. He has been the champion of clean and green of Jacksonville, a believer in sound fiscal policy and a supporter of proactive policing. During his tenure as mayor, this building has been reworked and rededicated to former Mayor Bruce Tichy. He has said goodbye to many on behalf of the city. Fanny Coleman, Turner Blunt, Nancy Cleveland, George Barrows, Bill Hemingway, and Finney Greggs. He was proud to participate in the groundbreaking for the Center for Public Safety and shared his memories of the leaky and crowded police quarters he had served within. In 2012, he dedicated the Jacksonville Police Training Center, having helped raise the funds to build the center. He has presided over the opening of Sturgeon City Environmental Education Center, Fire Station 2, and redesignated Jack Emiette Field. He was proudly welcomed he has proudly welcomed the families of the Beirut bombing victims and survivors. He is only the sixth mayor to issue the annual statement that we would never forget the events of October 23rd, 1983. In 2011, he helped to dedicate the Beirut room at the Jacksonville USO. 
It still serves the families and instills pride in new Marines to the area about the legacy of the Beirut bombing. He proudly represented the community during the dedication of the Mumford Point Memorial. He participated in the 50th year observance of the Vietnam War. He gives personal account of his loss during the annual Peace Officers Memorial Day observance. He has participated in the annual observance both at Lake Bittner and the new memorial at the Center for Public Safety. He helped to dedicate that new memorial in 2018. He has proudly rode across the new Phillips Bridge in Pink Cadillac in the Pink Cadillac in opening the ceremony, presided over Groundhog Day observances and opened hotels, stores, and other businesses. He was proud of the Freedom Fountain as it evolved from his support after a Beirut observance to the dedication in 2012. He got wet at the water treatment plant opening when we opened it and laughed with other council members at the event. I think Jerry did that on purpose. But I don't know. <laughs> he had presided over the opening of the Jacksonville splash pads where he did not get wet. He was a little bit wiser then. He was the last city official to ride in a fire truck gifted to the fire science program at Coastal Carolina Community College. He has delivered powerful messages during the annual state of community, but he did lose the record for the longest address, and we won't let you forget that either. <laughs> he has created lasting relationships with military leaders. He stood on a platform outside this building for the 75th anniversary of the 2nd Marine Division in 2016. He has welcomed governors, Naval and Marine Corps officials, state officials, county officials, U.S. Senators and Congressmen. And he has received the Order of the Longleaf Pine for his accomplishments. He still works at Coastal Carolina Community College and is the department head for the Cr Criminal Justice Curriculum Program. This evening, his wife Janice is here with us and his sister Robin. Together, they have two daughters they cherish. And this weekend, the mayor and Janice had some quality time with their twin granddaughters. <laughs> Today, we honor Mayor Sammy Phillips for 45 years of service to Jacksonville with a short video, and I hope you'll join me in watching. It's a lot of years, my friend.
served with you all these years, and uh, I'll tell you, I was, I was very proud today to be such an integral part of Jacksonville, North Carolina, Onslow County, and all that you brought to us. It will forever be remembered. So congratulations. Thank you. And thank you. Wow, caught by surprise. I didn't realize that much time had gone by. <laughs> what is that saying? You, time goes by quick when you're having fun. And, and uh, I really have enjoyed every, every minute of the service I've had with the city. Sometimes it's been a little bit trying at times, but you know, when you look at the overall picture, I've enjoyed, I have enjoyed serving the citizens of Jacksonville which I'm very proud to have been called my home. And I've been here since the day I was delivered at Onslow Memorial Hospital so many years ago, which I'm not going to quote that, say that one. <laughs> I appreciate my wife, Janice, and my sister, Robin, for coming up here tonight, taking the time to come up here tonight. And uh, I want to say that I'm very, uh, I just can't say enough about the body of people up back there that I serve with. Uh, they're just great people that have the best interest of the city of Jacksonville at heart. You know, we don't always agree on everything, but hey, it's a sausage factory, right? <laughs> we, have to, we have to make a mess before we make a good product, and, and we do that sometimes, right? <laughs> but we work together well. Our personalities work well. I'm just very fortunate to have the staff here that we have uh, that get it done on a daily basis, starting with Dr. Woodruff, who we just honored with 10 years a moment ago. We got John out there, Ron, and all the way down to the, to the person that picks up the recycling and garbage every day. Without those people, this city would, uh, would not run the way it should. And I'm gonna tell you something, having been here all my life, I've seen this city actually develop, evolve into a city that, yeah, it was kind of so-so there for many, many years, but now it's one that I know that we all are proud to call home. You know, there's people, you know, we've all decided to make this home. I don't think anybody's trying to get in a hurry to get out of here. But uh, I want to thank you very much for the recognition tonight. I didn't realize 45 years had gone by and uh, <laughs> got caught by surprise. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what were you, 10 when you started? 10 years old. <laughs> 10 years old when I started working city. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Not a good liar, am I? <laughs> I wasn't 10 years old when I started working here. Okay. Well, that was a surprise. Thank you very much, everybody, for that indulgence there. Okay. So we have adoption of the minutes uh, for the meeting and the uh, or minutes for the past meeting on April 21st, 2020. And we have some consent items here and I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt uh, the minutes and the consent items. So Second. Second. Uh, any discussion here? Not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. All right, so we got now a couple of uh, public hearings that we're gonna conduct. First one is a map amendment rezoning from a corridor commercial to residential multifamily low density. Uh, and uh, Jeremy Smith's gonna introduce this or present this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Agenda item 16 is a rezoning request submitted by Jenny and Carol Humphrey and Deborah and James Parker. It is proposed for three properties on New Bern Highway they're totaling 1.59 acres, approximately 0.53 acres apiece. They are currently zoned corridor commercial and they are requesting to rezone to residential multifamily low density. The 
before you is an aerial photo photograph of the sites. All three properties currently have single family homes on them. Next slide, please. As stated, the project, the properties are currently zoned corridor commercial. It is bordered to the south by zone, uh, public, uh, Pumpkin Center Volunteer Fire Department, also zoned corridor commercial. The Pumpkin Center Shopping Center to the direct south, uh, the corner of Wolf Swamp and Newburn Highway. And then the remaining properties across Newburn Highway and to the north are all zoned single family, low density, and used for single family. Before you on the screen is the Cama Future Land Use Plan. All the pink, reddish properties are designated as MX, which is mixed use, which could be commercial or residential. There we go. Um, as the proposed zoning would change this to RMFLD, this is what the map would look like. Uh, this request is a result of one of the property, property owners wanting to sell their property and they got through the, to the closing process and the mortgage company would not offer a loan because currently zoned as quarter commercial, single family is not a permitted use. Mm -hmm. So if the home were to be damaged beyond 50%, it could not be rebuilt under the current zoning. And so working with staff, the three property owners are asking city council to rezone these properties to residential multifamily low density. This is a drastic change in terms of intense intensity. Only residential uses would be allowed on these properties. Staff and the planning advisory board have, are recommending approval of this request based on findings of fact A through J being found in the affirmative and that the rezoning advances the public interest by limiting commercial development among existing and developed residential properties. Um, the applicants did ask if they needed to attend. I felt that staff could represent their interest in any questions that city council may have for staff or them. And I'll be happy to do so. Any questions of Jeremy? Thank you. Thank you. Back to the front here. Okay, we're uh, doing a, we're gonna, do a public hearing here. So I'm going to close the uh, or recess the uh, regular meeting and open a public hearing in this matter. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on this matter out in the hallways or anything? Okay. With no one here, I'm going to close the public hearing. Councilor, you're being asked to uh, consider the proposed uh, rezoning. And so if I move that uh, we approve the rezoning request, accepting the uh, evaluation found within the staff report. Uh, findings of fact uh, A through J being found in the affirmative and that the rezoning advances the public interest by limiting commercial development among existing and developed residential properties. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman. Item number 17, we have a public hearing for a unified development ordinance text amendment. Uh, this is amendments to the Article 5.2 Landscaping Standards Amenity uh, Utility Pond Fencing. And Ryan's going to present this. Good evening, Mayor Council. As you may recall, back in February, we had a City Council workshop where we brought to City Council the fact that we've had some inquiries about uh, the desire to install fencing around amenity ponds. Currently, the ordinance prohibits, next slide, please. The, uh, the ordinance currently prohibits fencing around amenity ponds. Those are the ponds that are typically in front of the buildings out closer to the streets and highways. So I thought I'd kind of go over some history. 1998, city adopted pond fence and landscaping requirements. We actually amortized, gave the businesses five years to install the landscaping and fencing required. And then in 2011, City Council adopted the current standards, which basically separated a utility pond from an amenity pond and did not allow fencing around the amenity ponds. Um, as I stated a second ago, we've, we've worked uh, with both City Council and the Planning Board with workshops, and now we've brought forth a proposed ordinance to Planning Board um, earlier this uh, month, which they rec last week they recommended approval. And 
basically we're now bringing that for your consideration for adoption. Next slide, please. Basically, since our workshop with council and planning board, we have created the standard that would allow amenity ponds to have a decorative fencing installed around the perimeter or a portion of the perimeter. Uh, those standards would be as written a maximum height of four feet. That would be a powder coated metal or similar material approved by the similar material approved by the city manager. Specifically, wood, vinyl, and chain link would be prohibited. The top rail, this was actually a great suggestion, I believe, from the planning board, where they wanted the top rail to be a solid construction, so not to allow spires or you know, projections to where it might prohibit an adult that needs to jump over the fence in the event that somebody were in the pond, struggling, whatever it may be, the opportunity for an adult to kind of scale the fence without any kind of hindrance. And then we've proposed to eliminate the shrub requirement when you install an amenity decorative fence. So it's not required, it's an optional situation where a developer could install this fence. So we're not adding verbiage about the width of the pickets and things like that for this proposal. Next slide, please. This is um, two decorative fencing examples that we gave the Plainborn City Council. We're actually going to have these placed in the UDO so that the development community can see examples of what we mean by a decorative fence. Next slide, please. The other thing that we decided to add for additional recommendations would be we don't want to prohibit a decorative fence from being placed around a utility. So we're giving them the option to install decorative fence. Don't know how often that will take place, but we wanted to make sure that it wasn't prohibited. And within that, because we are requiring a fence in that situation for safety reasons, we're going to reference the building code fencing requirements. This was actually a suggestion by John Carter to make sure that, you know, there's, there's legal requirements for fencing around pools to make sure that, uh, like you can't get a, something wider than four inches, like a person's head larger than four inches couldn't fit through the picket. So we're going to reference the building code for those utility ponds. And um, we will adjust the tabling. Since we've added that picture example, we'll have to adjust the other two tables. So just asking City Council to adopt this unified development ordinance to provide another tool for the development community. It'll be a nice looking fence for those ponds that are constructed in a, as, as an amenity. And one of the most prominent, I won't name the site, but one of the most prominent sites that kind of has brought this up is a developer constructed a site and then sold it to another person. Well, that, that buyer now wants to have a fence around it for liability reasons, because there's a school bus nearby, whatever it may be. Well, we cannot allow it under the current ordinance. This would give us that opportunity to say, well, you can but it's got to be a decorative fence. Be happy to answer any questions that the mayor council may have and uh, stand ready to try to answer those questions. Any questions of Brian? Council? Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to have a public hearing, so I'm going to recess the right council meeting, open up the required public hearing in this matter. Anyone? Still don't have anyone here? Okay, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing, re reconvene the regular council meeting. You're being asked council to consider the unified development ordinance text amendment. And add that uh, we believe that I believe it advances the public interest by adding a, a additional op optional fencing that could be used around amenity ponds within the current ordinance. Second. I have a motion and second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you, Ryan. All right, we're going to take a, a little uh, break here in the action. We're going to recess for a few minutes and come back. Okay, Jack Hamiot. It's hard to believe that more than 18 months have gone by since Hurricane Florence visited our community. We have a number of structures throughout the city that continue. As you know, code enforcement recently gave you a document that showed the number of structures that we're still working with where people have tarps on their roofs. 
The major building that was damaged with the city, though, was the historic center. You've heard two public speakers earlier this evening talk about the importance of Jack M. Yet in the history of the city. And you've heard them talk about the importance of moving forward. When you look at the damage that was done to the center, it was extensive. Both the one-story front portion and the gymnasium portion had substantial water damage. After the storm was over, we did an assessment of the building itself. And through negotiations with our insurance company, which is the North Carolina League of Municipalities and their risk management pool, and through the hiring of Sawyer and Associates, we did our own analysis to negotiate a settlement. You will recall that the settlement was for $750,000. The city attorney and Gail Maids are to be commended for the work they did in that settlement. Because through that settlement, we pointed out that not only should we be allowed to recover the cost of the building repairs, but also the cost of architectural and engineering fees, which may or may not actually be expended. When I say may or may not, what I mean is those fees would only be expended if you rebuilt the facility as it was prior to the storm. Altogether, we did settle for $750,000. Using your own staff, we have refurbished the front part one-story building, and we have spent roughly $50,000, leaving your current balance of $700,000 in that account. We hired John Sawyer and Associates to come up with concept plans, but you'll remember long before we hired that, uh, that consultant, the city staff under Susan's leadership did an excellent job of going out and surveying. Mr. Jackson, whose ward it is, went out and knocked on doors. I know the mayor and several of you are out knocking on doors, asking people to fill out surveys to let us know what it was that they wanted. We turned all of that survey information over to Sawyer and Associates. They came up with six concepts. You will recall that at a point in time, we presented those to you and you agreed to reduce them down to two concepts. What you're actually going to see tonight are three concepts. Why? Because as the manager, I felt that concept one probably wasn't going to be what you wanted. I was concerned that concept two might be more expensive, and therefore what you should have is a third alternative. So what I'd like to do this evening is brief you on the three concepts. When you look at the overall site plan, you can see the ball field, you can see the splash pad at the top, you can see the parking improvements. This mayor and council have made millions of dollars worth of investments in Jack M. Yet. Some have come from your general fund, some have actually come from community development block grant money. And in the days ahead when we open the splash pad, you will find something totally new that was installed by your own employees. And that is screening or covering. They have built three areas with large canvas covering to provide some shade. You'll also remember that last year we opened the new restrooms that were there. Concept one is a multi-purpose center. It proposes a building that is very similar to the size of the gym, quote unquote, that was there prior to the storm. What you would get in components with the multi-purpose center would be a multi-purpose space. Again, generally the same size that you had before the storm. You could play basketball on that, but it would be a non-regulation court. It would give you new offices, new restrooms, a new entrance, because in all three concepts, we're moving the entrance from the street side to the parking lot side. And you could add one volleyball court. What concept one, the multipurpose center does not give you are regulation courts. So for example, when we have our summer basketball league and we use all of the high school gyms and middle school gyms, you could not use this gym just as you could not use Jack M yet before the storm Correct. for those tournaments. It would not give you any youth league courts because again, the court does not meet the minimum width or length for high school, 
nor for Youth League. And unfortunately, Mr. Bittner is not with us tonight, but it would also not give you any pickleball courts. It would give you a non-regulation basketball court, office space, new restrooms. It would be a very nice addition to the community. We don't want you to think that if you select concept one, that you are giving the community something less than they had. You're actually be giving the community more. When you look at the concept plan, you can see at the lower part where it says game room, and you also see the area where it says fitness space. That is the current one-story building. From the area that ends the, from that building back to where you see the orange basketball, all of that would be new facility. You can see that the entrance would come from the parking lot, which is the top of the graphic. You would come into a new area. You'd have brand new restrooms. You'd have a reception area. You'd have some supervisory and staff space. You would have a multi-purpose room. It is laid out in this graphic to be a basketball court. But remember again, it does not meet any standards other than just what I would call pickup basketball. The cost of this option, the Sawyer work also includes a independent person who does opinions of probable cost. The estimate for concept one is basically three and three quarter million dollars. You have available 700,000 that would need $3 million. Now, what does the 3 million include? It includes all the architectural engineering cost. It includes a 15% contingency. It also includes a 10% cost escalator. So overall, you could build this facility, we feel very comfortably in the range of three and three quarter million dollars. And you would need to come up with roughly $3 million to build concept one. The other end of the scale is concept two. This is a gym with major center expansion. Once again, it would enter off the parking lot. What you would get is a high school court, full dimension, 84 feet long by 50 feet wide. You would get three pickleball courts, two volleyball courts, restrooms, entrances, new office space. What you would not get is the youth league courts. Now, what does that mean? Let's look at the graphic. In this graphic, very similar to the first concept, you would enter off the parking lot. You would see the restrooms that are new in the same general area. Neither of these concepts include locker rooms. If we're going to add locker rooms, I would suggest that be at the commons where you would actually have more of your tournament play. But for this facility, you can see the new administrative offices at the top. You can see the size of the gymnasium. The gym is certainly large enough to play high school basketball or youth basketball, but only on one court. It is not large enough to turn side to side and play youth league basketball. Now you could certainly play what I would call non-league basketball. So for example, when my granddaughter who was six years old was playing in the basketball league, she really didn't care whether the court was 84 feet long or 50 feet long. She just wanted the ball. And she stood there the whole time saying, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open. The problem was there were six people around her and nobody on the team was strong enough to actually pass the ball to where she was. But what you would get with this facility is a very nice gym. And going back again, you can see three pickleball, two volleyball, restrooms, entrance, and so forth. The cost of this is five and a half million dollars. You have 700,000 in the bank, you'd have to come up with 4.8 million. As manager, when I looked at these two options, I said, we need to see if we can find something that accomplish, accomplishes what the community wanted, but is somewhere in between the two for price. So we came up with concept three. Concept three has the exact same gym, but with minor center expansion. Remember concept two was major center expansion as far as more offices and those type things. Concept three is a full-size gym, just like concept two, but with minor. 
What you'll also see, you would have the major multipurpose space, the high school regulation court, three pickleball, two volleyball, restrooms, and entrances. What you would not have are the youth, youth league basketball courts, and you would not have as much office space. Mr. Warden would be interested, I think, in this particular concept and if you, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. You will notice in this concept, we use a center corridor that loads both buildings. That's a much more cost-effective way of designing a building. In the other two concepts, it is a corridor that's only loaded on one side. But you can see in the yellow that you would come into the entrance. You can see that the corridor not only functions for the gymnasium, but it also functions for the one-story building. Again, we see new restrooms. You'll also notice though in the existing one-story space, it's basically leaving the building as is. It will be refurbished to a degree, but the building is sound and does not need significant work. The cost of this is 4.8 million, you have 700,000, it would be 4.1. How would you pay for this? If you borrow from any source such as a bank or debt, you have to go through the LGC, the Local Government Commission. So if you're going to go out for local banks, Gail has already checked and the general interest rate for a five year or seven year note is three to four percent. The funding source for your payments would need to come from your four cent capital reserve. Now they could come from other sources, but the most logical place is where you do all of your capital projects and that's in the four cent reserve. Concept one, which is the multi-purpose building, your annual payments would be between 620 and $640,000 just depending on the bid from the bank. Concept two, which is the largest, you can see your payments get up to a million dollars a year. Concept three, which is basically a middle ground, you can see your payments are between 840 and 870,000 a year. Funding sources, a second thought would be loan yourself the money. We have a capital reserve we know that it is essential that we keep a minimum amount, roughly $10 million in that general fund reserve. I said capital reserve. I actually meant your general fund balance. We need to keep at least 10 million in there for hurricane recovery. We also know with things like C-19, COVID-19, we need to have a very sound reserve. Into the, under this concept, the general fund balance would loan to the four cent reserve through an inter account transfer, the necessary money. You would pay it back with no interest or you could decide to charge yourself interest. But what you would do is you would pay it back over five years beginning in FY23 and continuing through FY28. You'd use the four cent capital funds to pay back that. In doing that, you would not have to go through the LGC. And that actually would be a financial savings. At this point, we've not calculated the exact amount of that financial savings, but I can assure you it is a fairly good number. Why do we recommend just a short-term loan? Well, one of the things that we have learned over the years is the more you can pay in cash, the more you can pay in cash, the more you can pay in cash, the more you can pay in cash. If you tie yourself up in debt, that handcuffs you for the future. That does bring us though to option three, and that is a 20 year debt. In the near future, we're going to be talking with you about long-term debt for your water and sewer, especially the expansion across what I call the Northwest Passage. It's appropriate on something like water and sewer debt because it is so expensive to spread that out over 20 years. But on something like a recreation gym where you are talking real money, but you're not talking 30, 40 million dollars, I would hesitate to encourage you ever to get into 20 year payments for a four, five or six million dollar expenditure. So 
you could combine that with the water and sewer debt, the four cent capital reserve would be the payment. But here's one of the negative sides of it. Because you're combining it with water and sewer debt, your water and sewer rates would have to be there to cover the entire debt payment. You could not claim, even though it's your intent, you could not claim in your pro forma that you're going to use general tax money to cover part of that debt. In looking at the pro forma, most likely you would have to raise your water and sewer rates more than you're currently projecting for those projects. So I would not recommend this funding source at all for those reasons. Here are the recommendations. I recommend to you that you consider building concept three. That is the modified plan that gives you a full size gym with all of the amenities and things that concept two has that you be, and the reason why it improves the center, it creates new recreation opportunities. It would actually create a home for pickleball. And I'm gonna tell you, there are a lot of people in this community who play pickleball. And Susan can tell you from a recreation standpoint, trying to accommodate the pickleball people in the morning play when she has before school activities at the commons mm -hmm. is difficult. So what you could do is have this, since it's not used for before school activities, it can become the home of pickleball, three courts. It also expands your volleyball activities. The other thing that I would recommend is that you authorize the architect to go ahead and begin the work, whichever concept you pick, authorize the concept to be designed as soon as possible. Use the current $700,000 to cover that cost. We estimate that's going to be somewhere between $300,000 and $350,000. One of the reasons why, currently there's an excellent bid construction environment. We know from the work and the bids that came in on the transit center, an $11 million project came in almost $2 million below bid, below estimate rather. We know that down in the Wilmington area, several courthouse projects have come in 10% to 15% below. Right now is an excellent time because of all the uncertainty that the C-19 virus has created. I would also, when the design work is finished, bring back to you an updated opinion of probable cost. If the construction environment, building environment stays positive, or if it turns negative, at that point, you could then say, all right, we're gonna move forward with bidding, or given what we now know, because of the loss of sales tax or other things, we're going to postpone. Even though we've selected a concept, we're going to postpone the actual award or, or advertising for bids. And again, I would recommend to you, and I believe Gail Maid's who is not in here, but I believe Gail would do the same. She would recommend that if you're going to move forward with any of these options, you do it through an internal fund transfer and you loan yourself that money for a five-year period. Before we open it up for general discussion, one other important thing that's on your agenda tonight is the PARDAF grant. We know that the federal government has made a lot of money available to address needs and opportunities through the uh, Corbin virus uh, event. We also know that the state of North Carolina has opened up significant money opportunities. Normally, your staff applies for PARDAF grants every year. We have received several, one for the Riverwalk Marina, one for the playground at Northeast Creek, this is a special round though, and the deadline for filing the application is next week. We are asking tonight that you authorize the staff to file a grant application for $500,000. In order to file that application though, you have to have selected one of these three options or some other option. Now let's go back and talk about that. Any option you select, you can decide a week from now or months from now that you want to go bigger, but you can't go smaller. So for example, 
if you feel comfortable tonight saying, look, concept one, which is almost, you know, 3.4 million, whatever the number was, that's the one I'm going to select for tonight. But over the next several weeks or months, as we study it, maybe we move to concept two or concept three. You could do that under the grant. What you can't do is select concept two tonight, which is the largest, most expensive, and decide a month or two from now, you're gonna shrink it down to concept one. So again, uh, we're asking you to give us a direction on concepts and whichever concept, then that will be the concept that we will ask your permission to put in the grant application, which is due by next Friday. Um, June 1st is the deadline, so we'll turn it in next Friday. Okay, good. Okay. I apologize for the lengthy presentation. Can we now get into discussion and y'all can give us some guidance? Council, any comments on this? I do have a question. <coughs> do you think the concept we choose would impact the Florida grant at all? I mean, does, does it matter which? We just need a direction on what to apply. The application is asking for a cost estimate and a concept. We have to have a floor plan. We have to have a cost estimate, and then we have to have your approval for application. So you don't think one concept is going to weigh? No. Know, either way, up. on no matter what the concept is, we have three elements that we apply for towards the grant. Either way, we'll find those three elements. I'll be honest, the concept two and three, um, a gym, a full-size regulation gym, is a, a stronger element, okay. but then we'll have other concepts. So concept one we would uh, have to research a little bit. We'd have to be a little creative on those elements, but the um, gym is a definite strong element as opposed to the previous Jack Emiet, because we did not have a regulation, if that helps answer the question. We also address that. If you look at concept three, you can put in your application that we're now having a home for pickleball, three courts. You can now say you're gonna have two full-time volleyball courts, and you're gonna have a full high school regulation. They don't look at your entire program and say, well, you already have this up at uh, the Commons. Mm -hmm. What they say is at this facility, at Jack Ham Yet, what do you currently have and what are you going to? Exactly. So you are correct, Mr. Thomas. The more things you can put in here that actually shows new, 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 the better off your chances are of getting it. I would say to you again, and it sounds like I'm, I'm selling, but that's my job as a manager is to give you my recommendation. <clears throat> concept one is gonna be the least competitive. It's certainly the least expensive. But I'd also remind you that when you look at the monthly or annual payments, it's not that different. So I would encourage you to either select concept two or three. Just remember, if you select concept two, which is the most expensive, you can't shrink. But if you select concept three, you can enlarge. Mm -hmm. Good sense, Let me ask you a question, uh, Dr. Woodruff, because I had mentioned before, because <clears throat> I was concerned about the fact that we don't have a hurricane shelter around here. Has there been any, um, you know, have you looked into that possibility of hardening up that, that shell? I don't know if there's any grants out there or we any. Thing we, hard we have build. not, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Now go ahead. Uh, we have not looked at this building. We would remind you that last month when you approved the, multi, the multimodal transit center, that the money was there to harden both sides of that entire building, and that will be used to house city employees. I would also remind you that uh, the county is responsible for housing the citizens. So yes, if you did take any of these concepts and harden it, you could then have the county use this facility. But we have not asked the architect to look at that cost. Let them be responsible. Piggy, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was about to say piggybacking on Councilman Jackson. So if it's the county responsibility, and let's just say for instance, if we wanted to do this with this new building, what are the chances that the county would release funding to help support that? Well, I'm quite confident with the mayor's great relationship with Chairman Bright that uh, he can talk Chairman Bright and the county into giving additional money to accomplish this uh, hurricane hardening. <laughs> yeah. did I, mayor, did I misrepresent the possibility? I would make a guarantee on it. <laughs> do what you can, Mayor. Do what you can. 
I do know that the county is always looking at, in a growing community, the county is always looking for more and more shelters. And this may be an and opportunity. It may, be, it. It, it may be something worth, you know, running by the chairman Bright because it does, I mean, it, 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 it could, it could part, help. Part of the problem may be in, in, in showers and bathroom facilities for, for our shelter. So, I mean, mm -hmm. Well, one of the other things that I would also mention to you from a construction background, the taller the building, the more likely it's going to be damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, the best, and, and I know there are different people who have different opinions on this. To me, the best way to house people in a hurricane shelter is in classrooms. Mm -hmm. That's not the way that most people do it. But the lower the building, the more flexibility you have, the less wind resistance you have. But again, that's another discussion. You had a second question. I had another then. second question. Um, piggybacking on what Councilman Jackson says, since um, this is in Ward 1, which is his ward, which also includes um, New River Air Station, what is the possibility of having um, support from the United States government that the base could actually use this facility and see it as another alternative that their citizens on the base can utilize this and we could, is there any way we can tap into government funding or even ask the base for a partnership with the funding for this particular structure? We can ask that. There's no question that in our recreation programs, regardless of whether it's here or Northwoods or at the Commons or wherever, that we currently serve a lot of military families. I would say though, any of the options you enter into, you should assume that you're the funding source. Mm -hmm. I mean, even tonight when we talk about a $500,000 possibility from PARDAP, whatever decision you make, you have to begin from the basis that the city of Jacksonville is gonna pay 100% of it. If we can get money from PARDAP, if we can get money from the county, if we can get some money from the base, all of that is nice, but your decision should assume that you're going to have to pay. Our taxpayers, each of us as taxpayers, are going to have to pay the full freight. We can certainly ask. Mm -hmm. But right now we're looking for a concept and mm -hmm. permission to fund this building, or fund, go for the uh, part of the yeah. That's correct. So further discussions will be down the road, yes. uh, correct? So let's 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 hurdle. Let's get over this hurdle first. Yeah. <clears throat> um. You know what? I was just wondering. Have you? What was our total cost from Florence? Nine million, a little over nine million dollars. Okay. That came out of your own fund, basically. Right? Yes, sir. And we have about seven million of that now repaid by FEMA, and hopefully in the near future we will see two more million to be fully paid. Have you done or started working on like a worst case? estimate with COVID-19? Uh, yes, sir. When you adopted the budget, uh, we had to assume that there would be no impact by C-19. That's why we adopted the budget we did. No one can guess the amount of sales tax we're going to lose. But when you adopted the budget, you also directed me to prepare a plan so that when we do see the impact, that we will be able to address that impact rather than be surprised. So what Gail and I have been working on is a three-level approach. Each level would address a million dollars worth of loss. So for example, if, you, if the sales tax comes in a million below the estimate, we know exactly those things that we are going to freeze or not buy or postpone. We have the same thing for the $2 million all the way up to $4 million. Uh, that plan will be shared with you all shortly. Uh, you may or may not have seen, well, obviously you didn't see the news this evening because we're here, but today I was asked on Channel 7, I believe it is, uh, does the city intend to lay off any workers? No. We certainly are going to freeze vacant positions. We certainly are not going to fill positions that are funded by the general fund until we know where we are. But you will receive in the next several days the full plan on how we will address level one, two, and three, with level one being a million dollars, level two being two to two and a half million, and level three being up to $4 million. I believe the email you sent out today said the first quarter sales tax was up $0.2 million. Is that correct? The February 
the Yale has gotten an advanced look at the February collections. The February collections are almost exactly what we got last year. I think they're up maybe four or $5,000. Mm. The real test is gonna be the March, April, and May numbers. It was at least a good sign to know that when the virus was beginning in the nation, that, that February did not have any negative impact on us. Other questions you may have on this item? Well, I don't have a question, but I kind of wanted to piggyback on what Mr. Carter, Mr. Hagan said. You know, I, um, when I look back at what Jack Amiet meant to us growing up here, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of kids that people probably thought was not gonna make it and become successful, I can say that they did. They left and went other places and they did great. And I have to say that Jack Amiet was the difference. And I know when I came back here, I never knew of Davis Street having a problem, you know, before. And I, that's Northwoods, you know? That's, all, that's what I knew it as before I left. And I started hearing about the other problems that New River was having. And I know when you don't have a place to go as a young adult, and now I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, kids being out for longer and programs possibly suffering as a result of the COVID-19 um, event that we are going to have, we will have more problems when we don't have the proper program and, and facilities. Basketball, it's really not about basketball to me. It's about what you use to teach those that come to play. You know, we got a lot of uh, leadership and a lot of kids that was shy and other things that they, they really opened up through the use of sport. And then a lot of those coaches was our teachers, you know? And we were just fortunate to have that around here growing up. And I would hope that we can use these facilities going forward to do what we can to make Jacksonville more of our city, as is, as is said. Um, but um, with that being said, anybody else got anything to say? I was just going to ask one more question. With, with Concept 3, is it going to encroach on the ball fields? No, sir. Oh, okay. Actually, none of the three concepts will encroach on the ball fields. Because it just looks bigger. I mean, obviously, it is bigger. But I, mean, uh, I do have one, one question or comment. Um, I, I, I'm, the, only problem, the only problem I have with, with, with two or three is, is no youth basketball. Is there room to expand that, that one wall? I mean, as we're looking at right there, the top wall, towards the parking lot to make it to where we could fit in two youth basketball side by side. We, you know, that's something we could do at a later date. I'm just, I'm just asking, is that, is that possible? We've actually asked John Sawyer uh, to look at that concept. You would not only, from his initial look last week, you not only would expand the width of the building, Sorry. but you'd also expand the length of the building. He is running some concepts. We're not right. to the point to actually show you that concept or give you an opinion of cost. Okay. But that is something, something that we, we can, can explore. To like if we if we go forward with with uh, one of the concepts, we can explore that. And and I want to I want to address that point for just one more second. This gym in either concept two or three is not the equal to the Commons gym. The Commons gym gives you the ability for side to side play at That's league huge. size. Right. This, this gives you end to end play. So when you look at the graphic from the right side to the left side, it gives you a full high school gym or, or court. What it doesn't give you are the youth league links and widths. But that is a concept that as, you know, like I said, you pick a concept tonight, we can bring back to your concept four and you can get bigger. You just can't get smaller. I got, I got a quick question too for you. When I was looking at this drawing here on concept three, yeah, um, if you're going to use that for tournaments play, I, I, I might be missing it. Is there any seating in this thing? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, there is. It, the seating in here would all be movable. 
Okay. And the reason why is because we want to make sure uh, gotcha. that we have the ability for pickleball and volleyball gives you the maximum flexibility. Okay. One of the reasons why you'll see the gym equipment storage area that's there. Okay. Or anything if you want to change the configuration of some of the right. stuff that's going on. We here. put mobile, we put, uh, we had that conversation and so those are considered mobile bleachers. Tip and roll is what we call them so you can them up, up, move them, store them, bring them out, and reconfigure as needed. This is, this is another thought I had, too. Of course, this may be totally... What about dividers in case you wanted to divide the, that big space into smaller spaces? You know, like, a, like at Sturgeon City. Uh, there is, a, Mayor, that, that's a good point. Uh, in our discussions with Mr. Sawyer, if you go to what I'm going to now call Concept 4, mm -hmm. which is the side-to-side -side play, Mm -hmm. Even if you did that on non-league courts, you could have a curtain. The estimate for that curtain is about $120,000. But mm -hmm. unlike the Sturgeon City, which has what I'll call hard walls, uh, that would be a curtain that you would, just like a curtain, you would raise it and lower it on motors. And, you know, that is something that gives you more flexibility. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to stress is don't look at any one of the concepts as the final concept. These are all jello. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at, you know, for example, I'm now looking at concept three. Uh, the new restrooms, they're shown there. They may wind up a little different configuration. But what we're trying to do is, is at least get some guidance. The final detailed plans will come back to you on any concept. So you will actually see... Yes, instead of the existing restrooms going way over there and moving here, they stay or whatever. And this is basically to apply for the part of grant. If you don't get the grant, we still move in any direction we want to. Um, this is just so that you could submit. Yes, sir. I'm, so we can move forward. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So well, let's the, just say the grant doesn't go through. We're still in the design and, and approval phase. Either way, we're going to try to put together what we think is the right footprint for the facility and like through a design right. process, I would assume, um, to ensure that we get the best bang for the buck. Because yeah. even if we don't get the part of grant, we're going to be financing it. Right. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Right. I'm just, you know, you yeah. always think of both that's sides a, of it. That's it, a body obviously, that's Definitely. wonderful. But you like know, you if said. it doesn't happen, you need to know that you can still finance it and build it. So yeah. that's a good, that's a good question. I'd like to make a motion on actually going with concept three. Um, for design purposes. Second. Discussion. Does that uh, motion also include authorizing us to file, to the, file, grant for the, file for the grant? File for the party grant. grant. Second, that. Mm -hmm. okay. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Here, not all in favor say the Bible saying aye. 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 All opposed. I would like to take a moment to also thank Ron and Glenn and John and also the engineering staff. We call him EJ, Engineering Jason, uh, for all the work that they have put in trying to come to this. Uh, we will file the grant application. Thank you very much for your guidance on this. Good teamwork. Thank you. We have our emergency management plan overview. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I appreciate you letting me present to y'all tonight a review of the emergency management plan for the city of Jacksonville, especially as we go through this pandemic and on the cusp of hurricane season. The current emergency operation plan is advised of four components. It's mitigation, preparation, response, and recovery to the physical threats of our mun municipality. What this provides is a playbook for the city to reduce the vulnerabilities to the people and property of all the hazards. It also is a comprehensive plan that supports the county's plan 
It supports the state's emergency operations plan, and it supports the national response framework. So no matter the situation, we're all working from the same sheet of music. It also reflects the local, state, and federal regulations and legislation. When I accepted this position, I also accepted the role as a city's emer city emergency management coordinator. I'm responsible for leading this organization through preparations in response to disasters. It also outlines the roles and responsibility of pre-designated positions during times of emergencies. As we all know, as we've all experienced, emergencies aren't courteous. They can happen at a moment's notice. So when this happens, when we ramp up the EOC, trying to figure this out on the fly is not the time to do it. So it outlines all those positions, responsibilities, and that way departments and their managers can also prepare SOPs for their departments to help mitigate these emergencies. Our current plan identifies these physical hazards. Uh, you can see we deal with most of them. There are a few of them that don't apply, but we've all experienced the large structure fires, the floods, the hurricanes, the severe weather events. Uh, the state is actually working to update the hazard mitigation plan, which will they are working on including a part that involve, involves cybersecurity threats. As I mentioned earlier, it's a four component process, mitigation, preparation, recovery and response. As you can see, there's not numbered and it's always an ongoing process. We'll always work in for emergency management. Mitigation, this is where we want to eliminate and reduce the hazards that affect our municipality. We do this through code adoption and changes, vulnerability assessments, planning and awareness. The second part is preparing, preparation. This is where we have our backup and redundancy measures. This is where we do our training. As a matter of fact, within public, uh, public safety, we're working with our Chad and his team for possible upgrades to the EOC in case we have to uh, enact it in the future. The third part is response. This is where the EOC is activated. This is where we actually respond to the emergencies. And we have to be prepared to sustain up to 72 hours just in case, you know, uh, state and federal resources aren't available to help us out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As we go through this pandemic, we've actually kept a written uh, incident action plan in place since the beginning of this to help deal with this pandemic. And the fourth is recovery. Uh, this is where we look at, we have debriefings with all of our partners. We look at what went well, what didn't go well, places we can make improvements. Uh, as we all know, we're still recovering from Hurricane Florence, still doing damage assessments. And this is where we look to make those improvements in the future, where we go back to that mitigation step. That's the end of my presentation, unless there's any questions. One thing let me mention before you ask questions. Uh, I know I had a citizen ask me, what is the role of the city when it comes to a health issue such as the COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And the answer really is we don't have a role relative to a health issue. You can see from what uh, Chief T has uh, shown you this evening, we're prepared relative to physical things, mm -hmm. an airplane crash. I'm not so sure about mudslides around here, T, but you know, but it's the physical things. The health type items fall under the state law to the county government. And I think we'd all agree that the county government's done a very good job relative to this uh, C-19 event. Uh, T, you want to address that any further? Uh, yes, sir. That is the health department and the county's responsibility. However, we've been working throughout this process with all of our partners. That's why that framework is good. Our plans are uh, synchronized. So as we're working with them to battle through this pandemic. We're all on the same page. We're working together. The communication is good. Uh, it's understood and we can continue to serve them as needed throughout this. So thank you. I have a question, uh, Chief. Is this, is this the first time this document has been put together? No, sir. It's been in place for years. And so basically it's just an update. Yes, sir. 
And who 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 reviews this for adoption? It's my responsibility. Complete yes, responsibility. Okay. There was a whenever after Florence was over, I'm sure that there was an after action report prepared and whatever needed to be tweaked was tweaked. Correct. Yes, sir. Sir. And collaborative effort in terms of uh, key personnel and how you designate those key positions during those emergency operations and. Yes, sir. It all works in that national response framework, the NIMS training, the ICS. Right. Yes, sir. I'll just give you one example. Uh, one of the things we learned from Hurricane Florence was being in the EOC with everybody being, you know, as you'll recall, because every one of you was there at, at one time or the other, you'll recall we had all the tables lined up and everybody facing into the center. That created a tremendous amount of chatter. So little things such as saying, okay, in the future, what we're going to do is we're going to still have everybody in the same room, but we're going to reconfigure where the tables are. Those are the type, some big, some small. Right. We, we learned from the uh, Hurricane Florence event that we really weren't ready for long-term rain. And so because of that, you've already authorized and the city has already purchased a different level of rain gear for your police, for your fire, for your public works people. Those are the type of things that come out of the after action report. Just one other question. Out of that report, I guess you would have some deficiencies and are those deficiencies identified and are they on a capital plan? Example, COTS or MREs uh, stored somewhere for, you know, like what, took place at the triangle where we had a numerous amount of people that now were responsible to feed and things that happened, I guess, you know, deficiencies. And the answer there is once again, those were identified in the after action. We have now, uh, Mike Inero was able to work with the base and we have secured extra refrigeration units that were on surplus from them. We were able to get those at no cost. We have purchased additional cots. Uh, we have tried to improve the flavor of the MREs, but so far that's not been successful. You will recall that when Irene came through town, whatever that was nine years ago, one of the issues that we found was our traffic control, our, our street, our uh, traffic lights were not set up to be run by generators. Anthony Prince was given an assignment and he has now worked with Duke Power and Jones Onslow so that every major traffic signal in Jacksonville can now be set up with a generator. And instead of putting out your police or fire personnel to direct traffic within a short period of time, we can have, assuming that the actual infrastructure wasn't damaged, that we can provide electricity. But uh, under T's leadership and others, uh, we are constantly updating that plan. We just hope we don't get very much more experience, okay, if you that. understand what I'm saying, with uh, new storms. Chief, I got a question. Um, is there any memorandum based on the, the impact of an event, and maybe we run out of resources, is there a memorandum of understanding with the military to get involved with some of the things that may be happening on this side of the fence? Yes, sir. We have some in place already with Camp Lejeune, uh, with the fire department and the air station. Of course, there's also stuff we'd have to do through the county because uh, they're responsible right, for, for emergency right. requests would have to be made through them. But yes, sir. Do we supply a, an individual to go to the county EOC during, during that to help yes, communicate sir, with liaison officers that okay. I do? We actually had two during Florence that were there okay. uh, through, throughout the whole event. Yes, sir. And I know we've, we've since worked out the issues about uh, curfews, county versus city curfews, or? Sir, I can't answer that. Oh, okay. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> He's not either, so. <laughs> well, just remember, the, the anything that the county government establishes, such as a mandatory evacuation, does not apply inside the corporate limits. I do know that the county has looked at creating, uh, for lack of a better term, zones, so that instead of saying everybody in the county has to evacuate, that the zone closest to the beach may be required to evacuate, but zones way up near Richlands may not. Mm -hmm. Any other 
questions of the chief. That's good. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have something else? Oh, uh, yes, sir. The other night, Mayor, if you'll allow me a little uh, latitude oh, here. Three minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I didn't sign up for public comment. Take your time. We have a call called a public service call. And the other night, the fire department got called out to help Dr. Woodruff uh, while he was painting his house. <laughs> <laughs> so as part of that call, uh, your one city campaign, I'd like to do a one-off of that. At the fire department, we've come up with the one satisfied customer campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to give this t-shirt to Dr. Woodruff on behalf of the fire department as a one satisfied customer. <laughs> <laughs> so he can educate the public and advocate for the fire department. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> New meaning to getting the cat out of the tree, right? <laughs> get, cat, get the cat off get the, the cat, uh, Get the cat off, off the, the lift. The, off the lift. <laughs> All right. Good looking shirt. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. In the dark. Who who called who called the fire department? Was it was it Richard or Gwen? Um, he was in the right, yeah, I, I, she, <laughs> I, I doubt she'd have called. She'd something. probably been. Uh, she, well actually I was up there and didn't and up on the lift and uh, didn't have my phone, so Gwen had to call, but she said, please don't send sirens and lights. <laughs> I didn't get her attention. Well, actually, interestingly enough, when she heard the uh, beeping going off on the lift, <laughs> she came out to see if everything was okay. And I said, yeah, everything's fine, other than the fact that the machine is now frozen and I'm stuck 35 feet in the air. <laughs> so, so the thank you very much. <laughs> Anthony's going to give you an overview of uh, some money that's come our way under the CARES program. So, Anthony, please. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. We are going to talk about some money that, that's come our way, but uh, before we talk about what we plan to do with it, I'd like to give you a bit of an overview on how much money we're talking about, where it comes from, and of course, as with any federal money, there are stipulations. So just give you a few minutes of background, but I'll try to be quick because I know the hour is long. We've talked about CARES already tonight. It's a federal package that's helped to address the coronavirus situation and in some cases stimulate the economy. Two trillion in total, 25 billion of that went to the FTA. A lion's share of that went to urban areas, which of course we are one. And if you put that through the federal formula, our apportionment for CARES is $4.23 million. Uh, put, to put that into perspective, that's roughly about three times what we get on an annual basis for operations and maintenance. So it's a, it's a good chunk of money, and uh, it, hopefully it'll allow us to do some great things. And of course, that's what we want to talk to you about tonight. This is very similar, similar to the stimulus program that occurred in 2008. Uh, but the big difference here, and I think the reason why this is going to be much more effective, is that there are not as many strings attached to this funding as there were with ARA. If you remember back in 2008, that money was, was um, specifically for shovel-ready projects. But come to find out, there weren't a whole lot of shovel-ready projects out there. So spending of the money ended up lingering a lot longer than it needed to. I believe the federal government learned their lesson from that, and they have authorized this funding for any transit expense. So whether it's operations, maintenance, capital improvement, anything that's an eligible expense under our current transit program, this funding can be spent on. Key provision is, is that it has to be, the, the expenses have to be incurred after January 20th. There is no expiration date currently established for the funding, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit more as to kind of what I think might happen in the future. But key here is zero local match. So we're talking about $4.23 million that we do not have any obligation to match. So we can just spend this free and clear on any transit related uh, purpose. They are encouraging recipients of the funds to spend these dollars first and try to spend them as quickly as they can because of course there is a stimulus element of this package. So as we started to develop our spending plan for the funding, we came up with some key assumptions. 
The first one is related to the fact that there is no timeline on the funding. Now, while that may, while that may sound great in the legislation, in practice, we know that when Congress needs money in the future, I'm not talking about right now, but in the future, when Congress needs money, they start looking for unexpended funds from programs like this. So what we would like to do is put these projects on the fast track and make sure that we can spend as much of the money on value added projects as we can before Congress starts looking for these funds for other purposes. Now, it's not to say that that will happen, but my experience is when this money gets long in the tooth, they will start looking. And our TAC members have been through that in the past where federal highway money has been rescinded. Another assumption here is the Jacksonville station is fully funded. And Dr. Woodruff talked about that just a few minutes ago, so I'm not gonna belabor it. But we're very grateful to the city council for your support of that project and awarding that contract to uh, HG Reynolds last month. Operations and maintenance, because we've gone to free fare for a portion of the current year, we have essentially purposed some of this money for operation and maintenance, uh, but it will certainly not be a lion's share. Because it's 100% money, that absolves us of any local obligation as well as any fair revenue generation requirement. So we can use 100% money for current year operations. And again, to expedite the process and implementing projects, we wanted to go with existing plans, both transit as well as ADA plans. And the reason for that is because the FTA recognizes that there's a direct connection between ADA accessibility and transit ridership. So every transit passenger begins and ends as a pedestrian. And if they are not able to access the, the bus itself, then you know, we're not accomplishing our goal of servicing the community. So here's the menu of, uh, of spending options that we've come up with to date. And it's probably counterintuitive to see a spending plan with no numbers on it. Uh, the reason is, is that we're not 100% on the numbers for each one of these individual items, but we are very confident in the ability to advance all of these projects with the 4.23 million. So over time, we might see some of the individual uh, project numbers change, but overall, these are the things that we would want to advance with that total amount of money. We've talked about operations and maintenance, so we won't cover that again. Bus replacement, with this money, as well as with some other money that we currently have from older grants, we're hoping to set ourselves up for six years of vehicle replacement without asking for any additional general fund support. So from now until say 2026, we will be able to purchase two buses per year, replacing a majority of the fleet over that time without any additional general fund support. Uh, Henderson Drive, we talked about the need for ADA improvements out there a number of times. And DOT, because they are resurfacing and, and they will come back, trust me, the resurfacers, you know, the contractor will come back when the, when the rain lets up. Uh, DOT will do some ADA improvements with the resurfacing package, but they are not going to do everything that needs to happen. Unfortunately, everything else that needs to happen really kind of falls on the responsibility of the city. This is a good way for us to handle that responsibility without any local obligation for the cost. The connection that we're making though, again, between transit and ADA is the fact that Henderson Drive is a very high um, volume transit ridership quarter. The three other ones we'll talk about here in just a minute with some other slides. But the bottom one, the shelters, that's what I would consider the keystone of this whole program. Um, right now we've got some money allocated to shelters, but that one is definitely going to ebb and flow depending on the expenses that are incurred through the rest of these, assuming council supports all of these, of course. So if the other projects ended up cost, end up costing less money, then we might spend more on shelters. If they cost more money, then we would spend less on shelters. The, the key though is while shelters are important until Jacksonville station is up and running and until we kind of redo all the routes to service that area, we don't want to put new shelters on the ground. Okay. Cause we don't want to have to relocate them. 
But what we'll do here is we will purchase them towards the end of the life cycle of this grant, keep them in reserve until we're ready to go ahead and install them in the field. So Western Carolina Forest, this is one of the projects that we want to advance. Uh, this project is fully designed at this point and essentially ready for execution. Uh, what we would like to do here is what you see on the screen. So I'll toggle back through that. Right now, there are virtually no pedestrian accommodations. We would like to go ahead and install high visibility crosswalks with signalized pedestrian, well, with pedestrian push button signals to help improve not only the safety of the crossing, but also uh, ADA accessibility. If you spend any time in this area, you'll know that there are a lot of crossings that occur at this location every single day. Um, and the transit connection here, of course, is the fact that we have two very high volume transit stops on either side of the road. So this is probably as close to a shovel ready project as we have, and of course, one that we would like to advance. Another high pedestrian activity area is around the courthouse on Old Bridge Street. So not only is it high uh, activity for pedestrians, but it is for transit as well. You can see right there on the screen, turning left from Ann Street is one of our transit buses. And just off the screen towards the bottom, we do have uh, a relatively high volume transit stop at, um, it's at Ann and College. That's right, I always want to say mill for some reason. Here, what we would like to do are called bulb outs or curb extensions. So the intent here is to improve pedestrian safety by narrowing the crossing of the road, okay? And by doing that, you're also slowing down the vehicle traffic in that area. We're installing high visibility crosswalks and also getting the pedestrian closer to the traffic in a safe way so that they can be seen by vehicles when they attempt to cross the road. This is a very common treatment. You see it in a lot of cities and it's very effective as well. The connection here, of course, is proximity to transit activity. We would do one here as well as at Old Bridge Street and Mill as well. So those two locations with this funding. And in the last project here, and probably the most substantial of all of them, is a proposed transfer facility. Um, we call it a transfer station. That's what FTA calls it. So in most cases, we use their words. Traditionally, we've had three transfer points for Jacksonville Transit. And as you recall, we just recently put the blue route into place. So you know, we don't have enough experience with it yet to know what type of transfer facility we might need as it intersects the other routes. But over the years, we've done a great job in improving the amenities at two of our transfer facilities. You're probably familiar with the shelters and the bus pullout and the lighting that we, that we constructed over on Doctor's Drive, as well as the excellent facility that's over there at the park and ride at Jacksonville Commons. We've also advanced Jacksonville Station, which is essentially going to be the home base of, of transit moving forward. But what we have not done is anything downtown where we do have a lot of ridership activity. So the concept with this last project is to create a transfer facility and it'll include these individual elements. Could be more, could be less. We don't know for certain at this point, but this is kind of the concept. And if I was to describe it, it would be a much smaller version of uh, the park and ride facility to include public restrooms. Um, public restrooms have become a big concern for us as of late with transit, because as businesses have closed, there are no areas for our passengers to use the restroom. There are no areas for our drivers to use the restroom. So this would give us a little bit of self-sustainability that we don't currently have. If you think about the other transfer locations, we have that capability at the Commons and we will have that capability at Jacksonville Station. We would also like to have that downtown as well. So again, the options that we proposed are here. Um, I think these are all value added projects, not only for transit, but for the community as well. 
really like the idea of going out there and doing Henderson Drive and being able to accomplish something with federal money that we might be responsible for otherwise. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about what we've proposed. If you think of anything else, we can certainly consider it. If you don't like any of these, we can certainly reconsider those too. Is, um, Sir. Since our bus is run over some of our less than perfect streets, are there any way that money could go to the street well, under the bus? <laughs> of... <laughs> so Dr. Woodruff already tried that connection. Oh, okay, okay. And so the mayor tried it first. The mayor tried it first. <laughs> we're all thinking in the same direction yeah. here, which is okay, a good thing. Quick. And the answer is yes and no, uh, okay? Mainly no. So <laughs> the answer is yes if it's connected to another transit project. So for instance, out there at uh, Doctor's Drive, when we did the pullout and the shelters, et cetera, transit paid to resurface a portion of the street, okay? So if it's connected to something else, we can do it. Just like we're getting ready to repave a section of Market Street associated with uh, Jacksonville Station. But to go out and pave, you know, Center Street <laughs> just because the bus rolls on it, no. not gonna be able to sell that one. <laughs> Still to ask. We can try at me yet too, but I'm not sure that you know. <laughs> Are there any questions about these options? Any other suggestions, concerns? So steps moving forward, we will be cutting a purchase order on the buses very, very soon. Because if I don't, Ed's going to hang me by my toenails. Some of them need to be replaced. Um, we are beginning the design process soon on Henderson Western and Old Bridge Street. Of course, we're waiting for concurrence tonight. Uh, the transfer station downtown will require a feasibility study, which we went through with Jacksonville Station. We'll have to revisit a very light version of that to get this going. And all along the way, we will be coming back with updates to let you know where we're, uh, how we're making progress over time. Mm -hmm. Who's uh, who's actually handling the money? The DOT? No, sir. This is direct correct. money from FTA. If DOT got their hands on it, we probably wouldn't get it. Well, that's why I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> this money is uh, direct from FTA, so we're just we've been dealing with them on this whole uh, on this whole new apportionment. Certainly good news. Thank you. And in the in the meeting with that, can we? Yes, we. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. This brings us to the uh, reports uh, section of our meeting, and I'm going to start with Mr. Warden tonight. Proud to be here, sir. Proud to have you here. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. Oh, just uh, congratulations, Mayor, on 45 years. Congratulations, Richard, on 10. And Thank you very much. Glad Thank to you. be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I echo the sentiments of my council members in congratulating Dr. Woodruff on your years of service that you've been with the city of Jacksonville and you, Mayor Sammy Phillips, on your contribution um, being a Jacksonvillian. Is that a word? Okay, <laughs> I just that? made yeah, it. Yeah, it I just made it. Yeah, um, it just gives testaments um, to what the leadership is for the city of Jacksonville. And um, I believe that 100 years from now, when individuals are enjoying themselves at the Jack Amiet Recreation Centers, think about it, generation of children and men and women who have yet to be born, I think that they will be able to look at this council and say that at that point in time, that we had a great vision and a compassionate heart that we wanted to give back and to serve our community. And for that, I am grateful and um, I am just proud to serve with both of you gentlemen um, to see your leadership and how it has developed within our community and generations to come would have many great things to say about this council and the forward motion that we decided this night. So thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. Not much, Mayor. Just congratulations on your 45 years and Dr. Woodruff. Uh, thank congratulations. You. Thank you. Jack. Thank you. Ditto to what Dr. Washington said. Um, thank you for your support over the years, for what you've done in the city. That's it. A couple, couple of, of updates, uh, Mayor, after you. I'm good. No, please go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm good, really. It's up to you. Uh, 
As you know, the Dix Crisis Center is up and operational. Uh, Mr. Lazera uh, serves on that group. We had a report this past week that in the year that it's been operational, we've had over 1,000 people who have served or, or been served rather through that. Uh, there's been very little recidivism, which was one of the concerns we have. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Lazera, as the chairman, is to be commended for his leadership there. And there uh, going to be more information coming on the Dix Crisis Center. Relative to your one city moment, we have a number this evening that we would like to, to share with you. There's some reports that Glenn is going to do. And of course, Glenn was in here for the census moment, so I got ahead of him. So Glenn, why don't you come back for the census moment? <laughs> 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 we'll, do, we'll do the census moment. Seclusion. This is a moment. We are still asking people to fill out their census forms. It can be done easily. Just go to my2020census.gov, put your information in, say I lost, I don't have the code or whatever, and you can do it. If you don't do that, call the 800 number there, and it's free and easy and just Eight really questions. fast to do. Here's where we stand right now in the response. Onslow County has broken 50% just today. Mm -hmm. We're at 50.9% today in response rate. If you recall about a month ago, the, you know, the nation hit that mark. And so we're, we're hoping to be there as well. So um, now for Jacksonville, we're at 51.1. .1. Mayor, Greenville's at 50.4. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're <laughs> nipping too close for comfort. We need to get folks out. Tuck on that situation. <laughs> um, today we had another report about the Census Bureau rolling out their items and such there. Your complete count committee has been meeting regularly and trying to match strategies, but you can't do too much, you know, if there's nobody out. The census workers think they're going to be out now about June 15th in North Carolina to get things done as it is. Remember, you can fill out your census. It's easy to do, and we need you to count at this time because it affects health care, education, roads, and other things that are over apportionment as a result thereof. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Glenn's done an outstanding job for this community and for the state in many of the things he's done relative to the census, especially in getting the rules changed, as you know, for counting deployed personnel. So, okay, uh, the one city moments. about is chicken sales. As you may recall, uh, in early May, we were called by the Department of Agriculture and they asked if the city would help participate in a chicken sale. 
-hmm. So we did have about 511 vehicles show up that day. Uh, the police department in conjunction with the Coastal Carolina Community College, they provided the space and we moved about 17,000 pounds of a chicken in one day, actually in about an eight hour, about a four hour period. So I think we have some video on that. Is that correct, folks? We may have gotten that out of order, so. Did you start putting chicken on your pizzas? We put a lot of it on there. As the tribute to the essential personnel, uh, your staff has been very responsible. Uh, well, let's go to a different one. Peace Officer Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. So let's run some comments on Peace Officer Memorial Day. Annually observed the Peace Officer Memorial Day. This year, the observance obviously did not occur in person uh, because of the event. However, the staff helped to organize a virtual observance uh, which we can see in this 119 second video. So if y'all will roll the video. Done. I think we have a, just a couple of other items to cover with you. Uh, transit ridership. Mm -hmm. As you will recall, you have now set up the fare box as being closed. And for the rest of this year, we're asking that you would continue that. Uh, when you look at the transit ridership, you can see that in the fare box days of April 1 through 9, now you can see with no fare box, the actual ridership has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that people will use this as an opportunity to go out and ride the transit and experience it. We think it's a good marketing opportunity. It also gives people the opportunity to not only experience this, but to better understand how long it takes to get from point A to point B and to understand the routes. The projected ridership for uh, May is, as you can see, almost 10,000 people. Hmm. I'm not sure whether that's the last one or not. We'll, be, we'll find out in just a minute. Right, let's see the chicken. Yeah. Okay, here goes the chicken sale. Now, this is at Coastal Carolina. Uh, we were there at um, 5 o'clock in the morning. There were already 34 cars there at 5 o'clock in the morning, people who had come all the way from 
Fayetteville or all the way from Rocky Mount mm. uh, to buy the chicken. You can see through the great planning of your police department and your transit department, uh, we set up a phenomenal process of moving cars through. Uh, the two semis showed up. We had uh, vehicles going down uh, each side of the semis and the uh, people from the uh, chicken house, I believe that was um, Rayford Farms. Rayford Farms. Uh, they really knew what they were doing. They had uh, high school football players from uh, one of, I believe it was from Wilson, uh, there to actually load. And a lot of chicken was moved in a four hour period of time. With that, we always thank you. It's been 10 very quick years together. We've accomplished a lot, but I would remind you, it's only accomplished because y'all provide the direction. It's our mission to accomplish. Your mission is to lead, and it's been my privilege to work with you for these 10 years. Thank you. We entertain a motion to adjourn, unless Mr. Carter has something. Motion. We have motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs>